Hi, I'm Movie Man Eric Houston, and I want to thank you for joining me for this look at a pair of animation powerhouses, Joe Barbera and William Hanna, two names that definitely loomed large in my childhood and even into today. If you ever watched Saturday morning cartoons as a kid, you know the names Hanna Barbera. They were producers of everything from Yogi Bear to Johnny Quest, the Flintstones to the Smurfs, and from Scooby-Doo to Space Ghost. The duo created more than 250 different TV series that have been watched by nearly half a billion people. Joe Barbera was born in New York's Little Italy in 1911 and developed an interest in art and animation while at school. When he graduated, he took a job as a tax man but continued to draw, sending his drawings to many local New York magazines trying to sell them. He would eventually sell cartoons to Red Book, the Saturday Evening Post, and several to Collier's. He soon found work in animation, first for the Fleischer Brothers Studios, then the Van Buren Studios and Terry Tunes, before leaving New York for Los Angeles and a job with MGM's animation department. There, he met William Hanna. Hanna was born in 1910 in the New Mexico Territory. As an employee at Pacific Title and Art, which made movie title cards, his artistic talents soon drew the attention of Hugh Harmon and Rudolph Ising, veteran animators who were then working on Warner Brothers' early Looney Tunes cartoons featuring their character Bosco. Harmon and Ising liked Hanna and soon made him the head of their ink and paint department, which was responsible for actually drawing and coloring the animated characters on pieces of celluloid. In 1934, the duo left Warners behind and took Bosco and several employees, including Hannah, to MGM. MGM's animation studio had long struggled in the shadow of Disney and the Fleischers, with their main character, Barney Bear, never truly catching on. It was hoped that Bosco might become their flagship character as the star of a new series of cartoons called Happy Harmonies, a deliberate takeoff on the Silly Symphony cartoons being produced by Walt Disney. In 1936, the duo invited Hannah to direct his first cartoon, To Spring. By 1937, the relationship between Harmon and Ising and MGM had soured, and the duo was fired. Hannah stayed with MGM, though, and soon found himself working at a desk opposite Joe Barbera. The two became fast friends and quickly developed a close, working relationship, even though the two couldn't have been more different than night and day. Joe Barbera was the more creative and story-oriented of the two. He was gregarious, enjoyed the L.A. nightlife, fancy clothes, and slick cars. William Hanna, on the other hand, was more loud and gruff and also more down-to-earth. He was a lifelong member of the Boy Scouts who enjoyed nature and the outdoors. At work, he was more process and mechanically oriented. It was perhaps these differences that made them such a great team as they could operate as two sides of the same coin. In 1940, they jointly directed the cartoon Puss Gets the Boo. The characters were a surprise hit with audiences and also enjoyed an Academy Award nomination. Encouraged by the success, Hannah and Barbera continued to develop their cat and mouse characters, ultimately turning them into beloved characters 
Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry were the smash hit that MGM was looking for. The cat and mouse's slapstick antics delighted audiences, and for the next 17 years, Hannah and Barbera would make one Tom and Jerry cartoon after another, ultimately directing 117 installments. Tom and Jerry's 11th cartoon, Yankee Doodle Mouse, would earn the pair their first Academy Award. Another 13 nominations and six wins would follow. No other cartoon characters, not even Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny, would ever receive so much attention from the Oscars. Tom and Jerry were so popular with audiences that MGM soon started putting them in live action films. Alongside Esther Williams in Dangerous When Wet, and with Gene Kelly in two films, Invitation to Dance and Anchors Away. In 1957, Tom and Jerry were still going strong, and Hannah and Barbera had been rewarded with the jobs as the heads of MGM Animation. At the same time, television was becoming more and more common and was quickly eating away at movie studio profits. MGM soon decided it was much more cost-effective to simply re-release old cartoons than it was to produce new ones and abruptly closed their animation division, putting Hanna-Barbera and their animators out of work, and keeping the money, the Oscars, and Tom and Jerry for themselves. While TV had just ended their careers, the duo soon realized that TV might just save them. After all, Americans were still hungry for cartoons, and early television was starved for content. Animators weren't a problem, as studios across Hollywood had made the same choice MGM had, there were now legions of skilled animators looking for work. Sensing the opportunity, the duo founded Hanna-Barbera Productions, with Bill Hanna receiving top billing after a coin flip. Denied the elaborate budgets of the movie studios, Hanna and Barbera began adapting their methods so that they could learn to make cartoons as inexpensively as possible. One way was to use fewer drawings, 2,000 instead of maybe 14,000 for a five-minute short. The movements wouldn't be as fluid, but it would get the job done. Another was to rely on dialogue more than action, a reversal from Tom and Jerry, which typically used almost no dialogue. Backgrounds were simplified and recycled, and close-ups were frequently used so that whole bodies didn't need to be constantly animated. More costs were saved through character design, specifically collars. By providing their characters with collars, they realized, Hannah and Barbera essentially made their bodies a part of the background and would only have to worry about animating the head for long stretches of time, leaving the bodies often static. The collar offered a clean break that could disguise the move and became a frequent part of future character designs as so many Hanna-Barbera characters would wear neckties, dog collars, necklaces, and even high-collared shirts. In this way, they believed, the budget for a six-minute cartoon could be brought down from $35,000 to only about $3,000. One major concession to their theatrical background was kept, though, from the beginning, the cartoons were produced in color, even though color television was not yet the norm. Hannah and Barbera wisely understood that once color became the standard, audiences would no longer want to see black and white cartoons. By animating in color from the very beginning, they ensured that their cartoons could be seen over and over again for as long as people owned televisions. As they always had, 
Hannah and Barbara split the duties of running the studio between them. Hannah would manage the day-to-day -day operations of the studio, as well as the schedules and the more mechanically oriented departments like ink and paint. Barbara would be in charge of writing and creating the shows, and would supervise the other writers and storyboard artists. The shows would almost never use written scripts, but instead used elaborate storyboards that looked a lot like a comic book page that would provide words and drawings to guide the animators. All of these techniques came together for Hanna-Barbera's first television program, The Rough and Ready Show. Well, things were bad enough, but hang on, Ready, because they're going to get worse. Here comes a giant condor, and that can only mean a peck of trouble for Rough and Ready. Shoo! Shoo! You overgrown chicken hawk? Hey, Red, look! That chicken hawk is chicken out. Old Big Puss is leaving. Well, if you don't do something quick, Old Ready's gonna be leaving, Steven. One of the very first cartoons created especially for television the name supposedly came from Hannah and Barbara's personalities. Hannah was rough and Barbara was ready. Hannah and Barbara liked the two-hander element of Tom and Jerry, and Barbara always liked cartoons about dogs. With this show, though, they decided to make the characters best friends, allowing them to put the focus on wit and verbal gags rather than the expensive chases and slapstick violence of Tom and Jerry. To this end, the characters would obviously need to speak, unlike Tom and Jerry. To voice the characters, Hannah and Barbara hired real-life friends. Don Messick played Ruff, a former ventriloquist and radio performer. Don was also the substitute voice of Droopy the Dog. Dawes Butler played Reddy, an impressionist who came to the craft as a way of overcoming his shyness Dawes was a frequent collaborator of radio comedian Stan Freeberg. By the time he came to Hanna-Barbera, he had already been the voice of Chilly Willie and Beanie Boy from Beanie and Cecil. Hi, boy. What's up? Gee, I'm scared. Me you know too. From? They're probably headhunters or something. Oh, now simmer down. Nothing to be feared of. No. We're not for sure those are headhunters. Me too. Besides, we don't have a good one between us. But see, now, I, now, no sense. Messick and Butler would also provide the voices for most of the side and incidental characters on the show and would become the backbone of Hanna-Barbera's voice acting for decades. Rough and Ready was a success, but not the smash hit that Hannah and Barbera were looking for to cement their newfound careers in television animation. That distinction, the first big hit, would belong to their next show, The Huckleberry Hound Show. Don't you frighten on now, Pussycaya. I'll get you down. Just take it easy now. Old Hawk ain't gonna harm you none. Just turn her loose, Kitty. Let go. When I say let go, I mean let go! Lucky for me, cats always lands on their feet. The show, which focused on the adventures of a laid-back southern hound dog, had been inspired by a wolf character that Dawes Butler had voiced in a number of Droopy Dog cartoons. Now, ain't that sweet? Get you right here, man. Dawes attributed Huck's distinctive voice to his wife's neighbor in North Carolina and was one of about a dozen accents he tried for the character. The show debuted in syndication in 1958, where it was sponsored by Kellogg's. It quickly became popular and, in 1960, became the first animated program to win an Emmy Award. Episodes of the Huckleberry Hound Show typically featured three distinct segments. There would be a Huckleberry Hound cartoon, a Pixie and Dixie cartoon, and a Yogi Bear cartoon. What happens when I pull a rope, Yogi? I sail over the wall, the parachute pops open, and old Yogi floats to the ground like a fallen leaf. Ready, boo-boo boy? Go! You forgot to let go, Yogi. Quiet, boo-boo. It don't mean a thing if you don't pull that string. Okie dokie, Yogi. Geronimo! 
Yogi quickly became as popular as Huck himself, if not more so, and in 1961 was spun off into his own show, where he and his sidekick Boo Boo would try to steal picnic baskets or otherwise try to get one over on Ranger Smith. Yogi was voiced by Dawes Butler, who was impersonating Ed Norton from The Honeymooners. Ranger Smith and Boo Boo were voiced by Don Messick. Yogi's popularity was somewhat unexpected, but he quickly began appearing as toys on cereal boxes, in national parks, in his own 1964 feature film, and even in a comedy album alongside the Three Stooges. It's Larry Moe and Curly Joe. He what brings the Three Stooges to Jellystone Park? We're here on business, Yogi. Business? What kind of business? Monkey business. Yeah, we're here to put a stop to your monkey business. But fellas, uh, I don't do nothing wrong. Oh, I admit I find a lot of picnic baskets that aren't even lost. And you keep sneaking out of Jellystone Park, Yogi. Yogi's enduring popularity has led to lead roles in numerous Hanna-Barbera cartoons, including Yogi's Gang, Yogi's Space Race, Yogi's Treasure Hunt, and Yo Yogi. Over time, Huck and Yogi would be joined by dozens of other Hanna-Barbera characters, many of whom were based on popular actors or television series of the day. Snagglepuss was based on Bert Lahr, who had played the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz and had coined the phrase, Heavens to Murgatroyd. The character Doggy Daddy was based on Jimmy Durante. And Top Cat was based on Phil Silver's and Phil's popular Sergeant Bilko TV show. In 1960, Barbera was even working to develop an animated version of The Honeymooners. But the networks weren't interested. Then, one night, a friend of Barbera's told him, Hey, what if you take that idea and you set the show in the Stone Age? Barbera quickly came to love the idea and began reworking this Honeymooners concept as a new show, The Flagstones. Unlike other Hanna-Barbera shows, The Flagstones would be aimed at a more adult audience, with the goal to air it in prime time on a major network. And instead of several seven-minute cartoons, each episode of The Flagstones would be one half-hour story cleverly infusing the standard blue-collar sitcom format with the sort of fanciful situations and props, like the family's many dinosaur-powered appliances, that only animation could provide. Barbera began pitching to the three major networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC, but all of them were skeptical about the show. After all, no one had tried original animation in prime time before. Barbera kept retooling the idea, pitching it again and again, hoping to change the minds of the networks, and at one point even produced this rarely seen Flagstone's pilot reel to help him sell the idea of the show. Well, Ma, when are we going shopping? As soon as I serve His Majesty's lunch. He's dining at the pool today. Where's Barney? Oh, he's trying on his gear. Gear? That's right. He's going to practice spear fishing in the pool. Spear fishing? Well, Ma! Oh, I'll be right back. I've got to feed the fish. Where do you want it, Fred? Uh, just set it down uh, where I can reach it. And remember, if you sink, don't let my best dishes go down with the ship. <laughs> Barney, it's you. Uh, did my spear fishing up I scare you? Out of my wits. And don't scare Fred, or he'll lose his lunch and my dishes. Hiya, Fred. And uh, what are you made up for? I'm going to practice spear fishing. Oh, you can't lose. You'll either spare him, or they'll die laughing. <laughs> How does it work? And don't point that thing at me. It's loaded. Oh. Oops. <laughs> Barney boy, you're making it tough to be friends. ABC, meanwhile, was in a bit of a bind. The youngest of the three networks, they had tried to differentiate themselves by offering family-friendly entertainment in prime time, and it had a great deal of success with Walt Disney Presents. 
NBC, however, had recently outbid ABC for new seasons of the show, in part by promising to air Walt's show in color, technology that ABC did not yet have. Looking for something to fill that Walt Disney time slot, and interested in being able to offer the novelty of original primetime animation, which even Walt Disney wasn't doing, to its audiences, ABC finally greenlit the flagstones. By this time, though, the show had undergone a couple of name changes. Hannah and Barbara had initially settled on calling the show Rally Round the Flagstones, until they found out that the flagstone was the surname of the main characters from the comic strip, High and Lois. They then changed the name of the show to The Gladstones before finally settling on The Flintstones. Sponsors were secured in the form of Miles Laboratory, eventual makers of Flintstone vitamins, and surprisingly, in the form of R.J. Reynolds, the cigarette company. Gee, we ought to do something, Fred. Okay, how's about taking a nap? I got a better idea. Let's take a Winston break. That's it. Winston is the one filter cigarette that delivers flavor 20 times a pack. Winston's got that filter blend. Yeah, Fred. Filter blend makes the big taste difference, and only Winston has it. As a quick word, I've included that last segment for historical purposes, but I want to make it absolutely clear that neither I nor North Metro TV endorse smoking cigarettes, which has been shown to cause cancer and even death. The Flintstones premiered on ABC on September 30th, 1960, and was a near instant hit, quickly cracking the top 20. Each week, audiences tuned in for the annex of couples Fred and Wilma Flintstone and Betty and Barney Rubble, all roughly analogous to the main characters from The Honeymooners. Still, hold still. Fred! What are you two doing? Oh, uh, 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 we were just uh, practicing some wrestling holes. Wrestling holes? Uh, sure, sure, weren't we, Barney? Uh, yeah, uh, like this one. <laughs> it's called the body slam. Uh, uh, uh. I guess men are just boys that never grow up. And if they keep this up, they won't grow any older either. Fred was voiced by Alan Reed a voice actor who had appeared on the Baby Snooks radio show and as the Russian wolfhound in Lady and the Tramp. Jean Vanderpile played Wilma. Jean voiced several small characters for Hanna-Barbera in the years to come and would go on to voice many more, including Rosie the Robot. Mel Blanc, the famous man of a thousand voices who gave life to Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, and dozens of others, voiced Barney. Betty was played by B. Benaderet, a longtime co-star on the George Burns and Gracie Allen show, and played, who also played the character Kate Bradley on Petticoat Junction. The Flintstones' baby Pebbles was added in the third season, during a multi-week event that echoed Lucy Ricardo's pregnancy just a few years earlier. Hey, hey, hey what are you doing? I just wanted to get Whatever it. Let me do it. Whatever you want. Whatever you want, I'll always get it. <laughs> hey, uh, Wilma, how about some shrimp and marmalade combo? Uh-uh. A chocolate-covered hard-boiled egg on a stick? Uh-uh. Oh, you love this. Sardines smothered in prune whip. Gene Vanderpile voiced the character, who was originally going to be a boy, until Hannah and Barbara realized that a baby girl would sell more merchandise, particularly dolls. The Rubble's baby, Bam Bam, was introduced the following year. Also debuting in the third season was the famous Flintstones theme song. Flintstones, meet the Flintstones. The song was written by Hoyt Curtin, with William Hanna providing lyrics over the phone. Meet the Flintstones has become one of the best-known TV theme songs of all time, and I'm sure at least a couple of you were singing along with that clip. It replaced an earlier theme song that was used for the first two years of the show called Rise and Shine. (laughs) 
after the arrival of Bam Bam, storylines on the Flintstones quickly became much more fanciful. Aside from Bam Bam's own super strength, there was the introduction of the magical alien, the Great Gazoo, voiced by Harvey Corman. The arrival of the Munsters-inspired Gruesomes, and guest appearances by the likes of Elizabeth Montgomery, playing her bewitched character, Anne Margaret playing Anne Margrock, Tony Curtis as Stony Curtis, and even a surprise appearance from this familiar pair. Now you see why I'm smarter than the average Fred Flintstone boo-boo. Yeah. The fastest way I know to get a picnic basket. Fred, the basket's gone. Oh, it figures. The Flintstones ran for six seasons and 166 episodes. It was followed a few years later by the Pebbles and Bam Bam show which featured grown-up versions of the beloved babies, as well as by The Flintstones Comedy Hour, The New Fred and Barney Show, The Flintstone Comedy Show, and The Flintstone Kids. There were also numerous TV specials and TV movies, including one where the Flintstones met their futuristic counterparts, the Jetsons. Watch the birdie. It's only ever here. Watch the booty, watch the booty. <laughs> Look out, there's so Dino, get over here if you want to get in this picture. That's okay, Fred. I'll be able to remember Dino without a picture. While the Flintstones were popular in primetime, Hanna-Barbera filled Saturday mornings with more action-oriented superhero shows like Birdman, The Herculoids, and Space Ghost. Fred Silverman, the head of CBS Daytime Programming, was looking for something different, though. And he approached Hanna-Barbera about creating a new mystery cartoon series that would be patterned on the popular teen sitcom, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. Hanna-Barbera writers Ken Spears and Joe Ruby set to work on the project about teens traveling in a van and solving mysteries. They first titled the project Mysteries 5, and it featured four teens and their dog sidekick who was named Too Much. The teens themselves were patterned after the characters on Dobie Gillis. There was Fred, who was based on Dobie, Daphne took after Thalia, Velma after Zelda, and Shaggy was based on the popular character Maynard G. Krebs. Ruby and Spears presented their work to Silverman and worked with him to tweak the concept, eventually renaming it Who's Scared along the way. Ironically, Silverman's bosses thought the concept was too scary for children. Disappointed, Silverman flew back to L.A. and relaxed to the music of Frank Sinatra along the way. He was struck by the line, Doobie Doobie Doo and that began to spark something in his imagination. He began to think about changing the whole focus of the show, moving it a little bit away from the mysteries and the four teenagers, and making the dog the lead character on the show, naming him Scooby-Doo, and then changing the show's focus a little bit more to comedy than horror. This new show would be called Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? and premiered September the 13th, 1969, on CBS. Scooby, fetch the beach blanket so we can bundle up. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Mike, what is it, Scoob? <laughs> I think he's had too many ice creams. <laughs> The show starred Don Messick as Scooby, who was largely using the voice he had created for the Jetsons dog, Astro. Frank Welker played Fred. Fred was Welker's first job with Hanna-Barbera, and he actually auditioned to play both Shaggy and Scooby-Doo as well. He has gone on to become one of the most in-demand voiceover artists in Hollywood, 
with credits that include Brain and Dr. Claw on Inspector Gadget, Ray and Slimer on The Real Ghostbusters, Megatron on The Transformers, and several different characters on The Smurfs, G.I. Joe, Captain Planet, Tiny Toons, and Animaniacs. He is particularly well known for his felicity with animal sounds and has played numerous animal characters like Abu in Aladdin, both Santa's Little Helper and Snowball 2 on The Simpsons, and he provided many of the lion roars for The Lion King. <laughs> Good. At age 74, Welker is still working today and since 2002 is the official voice of Scooby-Doo in addition to continuing to voice Fred in most of the new Scooby-Doo videos. <laughs> What's the matter with Shaggy? He's broke. Joining Messick and Welker was Nicole Jaffe as Velma. A member of the famous Actors Studio, she had also appeared in the movies The Trouble with Girls with Elvis Presley and Disney's The Love Bug. Theater actress Indira Stefiana played Daphne, but only for the first seasons. When Indira left for New York, TV actress Heather North took over the role and continued to play Daphne in various cartoons through 2003. The original voice of Shaggy, meanwhile, might be better known to audiences by his work on the radio. And moving up the same six notches is the first hit by the new British group, Tears for Fears. Everybody wants to rule the world. Slipping to number two. After one week in the top spot is another new group, this one from Scotland. Simple Minds with Don't You Forget About Me. And pole falling in from number four to number one is Wham! with their third consecutive number one smash. Wham! hits the top with everything she wants. Yes, Casey Kasem, the longtime host of radio's American Top 40, played Shaggy. The son of Lebanese immigrants, he started the popular radio show just a year after starting as Shaggy and continued his cartoon voiceover work well into the 80s playing characters like Robin the Boy Wonder along the way. He voiced Shaggy until 1995. Now, how many of you know the show Scooby-Doo? Yeah. There's a character that I play on that show, the sidekick of Scooby-Doo for the past 17 or 18 years, and his name is Shaggy. And Shaggy would like to say a few words to the young people out there, all right? Go ahead. Are okay. you Shaggy? I'm Shaggy. Go ahead, Shaggy. Shaggy talks like this. The way he talks, Jer, Go and ahead. he's always talking about his good buddy Scoob, his old friend, his old pal, his old dear, dear buddy. Scooby and Shaggy were unusual characters in the world of TV comedy. Not only were the duo unrepentant cowards who often hurt the team's prospects rather than helped them, they were also two very similar characters with similar personalities. Unlike most comedic duos like, say, Laurel and Hardy and The Odd Couple that are typically portrayed as polar opposites. Freddy said to search the place from top to bottom. Wouldn't you know we'd be the ones to search the attic? <laughs> like this place looks like a storeroom for spider webs. Wow! A spooky room filled with haunted spider webs and creepy old looking chests. Wonder what's in them. Yo! Scooby Doo, Where Are You aired for two years and typically featured Scoob and the gang investigating a mysterious ghost or supernatural creature that was almost always revealed to be a crook in a mask. Dr. Jekyll! So it really was Dr. Jekyll behind the ghost of high jewel robberies. It sure was, Sheriff. When all his crazy experiments failed, Dr. Jekyll decided to turn to a life of crime. The show was hugely popular, with 65% of the Saturday morning audience tuning in for their exploits. After two years, Scooby-Doo Where Are You became the new Scooby-Doo Movies, a new hour-long program that saw Scoob and the gang teaming up with popular celebrities of the day, including Don Adams, Sonny and Cher, Phyllis Diller, 
Jonathan Winters, and Dick Van Dyke. Look at those costumes. They're glowing. The ghosts are nothing but luminous cloth. Worked by wires and springs. It's all a fake. <laughs> those grunts sound real enough. Shh. Something's behind those motors. <laughs> Strongman. Scooby was so popular that he and his friends would persevere in several different shows over the decades, like Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, The Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, a favorite of mine as it involved Vincent Price, and A Pup Named Scooby-Doo. There has also been several movies, including one released just last year. And if that weren't enough, Scooby's popularity impacted Hanna-Barbera's shows for decades to come as Hanna-Barbera would make one show after the other that followed the basic format of a group of teenagers and their wacky animal sidekick or other kind of weird sidekick solving mysteries. I'm talking about shows like Jabberjaw, The Funky Phantom, Goober and the Ghost Chasers, Speed Buggy, and Captain Caveman and the Teen Angels. In 1966, William Hanna and Joe Barbera sold their company to Taft Broadcasting for $12 million, which is nearly $100 million in today's money. The company was later sold to Turner Broadcasting System, which was later acquired by Warner Brothers. Despite the sale, Hanna and Barbera continued to remain the heads of the company until 1991. Thereafter, they kept working as advisors. William passed in 2001 at the age of 90 from throat cancer and Joe followed in 2006, aged 95. Though they were as different as night and day and rarely interacted outside of the office, the two remained collaborators and close friends for their entire lives. True comrades whose bond of friendship can be seen reflected in many of the pairs the duo created for television, like Rough and Ready and Yogi and Boo Boo and Fred and Barney. In all, the duo created some 2,000 cartoon characters whose exploits have been seen by nearly half a billion people around the world and have been translated into more than 20 different foreign languages. At their peak in the 1960s, Hannah and Barbera were supplying audiences with six hours of animation each and every week. Still, Believe it or not, they were often resented and downright hated in their day by artists and critics, who felt that Hanna-Barbera's pioneering limited animation techniques were ruining animation and were no comparison to the lushly produced theatrical counterparts. Throughout their lives, Hanna and Barbera refuted these claims, as they had when they first created Rough and Ready. They felt that their innovative animation techniques saved an entire industry and allowed for the transition to television, providing work to legions of animators who were out on their ear once the major studios had largely given up on short animation. To my mind, it's hard to argue that their backs against the wall, Hannah and Barbera created something new and not only allowed a medium to endure, they did it with pizzazz gifting the world with dozens and dozens of unique, immortal characters that many of us still remember fondly. I want to thank you all for joining me for this look at the careers of William Hanna and Joe Barbera, two true animation pioneers whose work is so dear to all of us, whether you're a big fan of Scooby-Doo or Yogi Bear or the Flintstones or of any of their dozen characters. I, I, for one, I, I love all of those odd little characters like Ricochet Rabbit and Squidly Diddly, Peter Potamus, and Magilla Gorilla. And I'd like to invite you to share your favorite Hanna-Barbera characters with me in the comments when you comment on this video. And I hope that you'll also like the video and subscribe to the Movie Man Eric YouTube channel. You can also email me at eric at northmetrotv.com if you would like to be added to my email list so that you're among the first to know when I've got a new class ready to get on the internet here so you can enjoy it. You'll also be among the first to know then when we are finally able to begin enjoying these classes 
live and in person once again. I don't know when that's going to be, but things are looking optimistic that hopefully it won't be too much longer. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed the class and I hope you take the opportunity to feel like a kid again, to check out some of these cartoons and remember what made Saturday mornings so much fun. I'll see you with my next class. In the meantime, please stay safe.